I want to get you started working on the telescope project. And what I thought I would do is, in addition to having you uh, begin working on it in your lab this week, I wanted to, I just wanted to give you a quick tour of the code, talk about the project and help you uh, get started on it and give you some background on, on what this is. Okay, so the this, this open source project was started last year, a year ago, by the students in the open source, first open source course that you're taking right now. And since then, we've had 70 people contribute to it. Some of you have contributed to it already, which is amazing. By the end of the term, I want all of you to have contributed to it. And um, the one of the reasons that I'm going to work on this project with you is that I think it's really helpful to be to get some experience working on a project with a lot of people. And so, you know, there are 50 or 60 of you right now. I'm going to throw all of you into the same repository at the same time. And it's, you know, it's going to be a bit of chaos. I recorded a video, actually. There's a tool you can use called Gorse. And what you're seeing here is a visualization of the Git repository. So this Git repository it shows everybody who's working on files. And you can see that at the beginning, it's mostly me. There's just a couple of files. I put a few files into Git. And then a couple of students get started. And then slowly, slowly, people start getting involved. And eventually, uh, the deadline comes around. You'll see exactly when the deadline hits. <laughs> and uh, everybody is jumping on board in order to get their pull requests merged. But you can get a good sense of what it's like when you get a lot of people working on the same project. It it's a very different feel than when you have one or two people working on a repository and you're trying to, uh, you know, share commits with each other and you're doing a pull request and somebody merges to master and and then that's it. When you have 50, 60, 100, 200, 500, when you have lots and lots of people all working on the same piece of code at the same time, you need a bunch of different skills. You need to be able to make sure you can do things like rebasing. You need to know how to uh, figure out where your Git commits are relative to other people's, how to merge and test people's code. You know, there's a lot of skills that you need in order to be able to do this. I think another reason I'm excited to get you uh, working on this is that Telescope is now a pretty realistic piece of software. Like uh, I'm gonna take you through and talk about all the different um, all the different technologies that are in use in it. But, you know, getting involved in it is, is gonna mean that you get to play with a lot of different technologies. And, and that's a lot of fun because, you know, sometimes you don't have a chance in a course or you haven't had a chance in your 0 0.2 to work on some of the things that you wanted to do. So here's a chance for you to be able to work on it. Okay, so let me tell you about what this thing is. I know you've already been working with it a bit um, with your blogs, but Here's the sort of the origin story of this project. So I've got all of you blogging. So this is my blog right here and everybody has their own blog. And the problem with this is that I don't want to go and read all of your blog posts individually. It's too much work. And so lots of open source communities, lots of tech communities have this problem. And so what what happened a long time ago, this standard RSS was um, RSS and then later Atom, but a couple of standards for syndicating your blog. So here what you're seeing is an XML version of my blog. Like this is the blog that you go to if you are a human, and this is the blog that you go to if you're a computer. So the computer doesn't care about all the uh, formatting and everything. It wants everything in a very specific format, like give me the dates, give me the content, who's the author, what's the title, all of those kinds of things. So an RSS feed allows us to pull data from somebody's website so we can syndicate it somewhere else. And this, this was really popular uh, before a lot of the big social media platforms. So today, what a lot of people do is they just go dump all their content into Facebook or into Instagram or Pinterest or whatever. But... If you're a programmer and you know how to make your own websites, there's something uh, there's something nice about owning your own content, owning your own platform. You don't have to follow anybody's rules. You don't. I mean, you can decide how you're going to format it. You're going to decide what you are and aren't going to post. You don't have to worry about other people doing certain things with it. So you have a lot more control. 
So many open source projects have a planet. And so planet was this piece of software or an idea. There's lots of different implementations of it that what you would do is you would take all these different RSS feeds from people that are working in a community and you would pull them all together into a single website. So the Mozilla project has a big, uh, a big list of people. So here's all the diff on the right over here. You can see all of the people that are in here and somewhere in here, mine, here's mine right here. So everybody who is in the Mozilla community, who's an active member and they're blogging, um, you know, they put their, their RSS feed into the planet. And then you just have to go to one website. You read through the planet and you see what everybody's doing. It's a fabulous way to solve the discovery problem. I don't have to know everybody's blog URL. I don't have to go and find, you know, your blog, your blog. I can just go to one place and read everything and it's great. And I love reading all of your blog posts and hopefully you do too. Um, many people who used to be in the course, even a decade ago, still blog into our, into our planet and they um, keep track of what other people are doing. And it's, it, it's a great way to build community and make sure that people know what's going on. Okay, so our planet used to look like this. And I have recreated this <laughs> partly because I used to love, this is this like old crappy website, but I used it for so many years that um, when we built the new system, one of the first things I did was I re-implemented this because I wanted to be able to still use it as kind of a simplified front end. So this is really old school, but you can see where it comes from. It's kind of like the same as the Mozilla planet, like really old style HTML thing. So we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who have who do open source at Seneca over the years and they blog with us. And so all of these different feeds, we needed a system that would go and download everybody's content whenever they made new content and then put it all together into this one web page that people could go and they could they could read to um, to go through. So the, the telescope project has gone through a series of stages. So last fall, right about this time, we started it and we went until December and we got um, to, I don't know what the, I don't know what version number we got to, maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, something like that. In the winter, I had 10 students who took uh, the next course with me who worked on going from 0 0.4 all the way to 1.0. And um, I have a big long blog post that I'll link in the readings today where I wrote about how we built this thing, everything that it uses, all the technologies, the architecture of it. Um, a lot of background information on what we did, and so that might help you. I'm going to talk about a bunch of this right now, so I won't I won't go through this uh, in detail now. Throughout the summer, we've had probably about four or five people who have continued to really maintain it, and this is what often happens with an open source project. You have a big group of people who contribute but they might contribute one or two things. And then you slowly have this, you sort of go into the center and there's a core of people who maintain the project. And those people, for whatever reason, they really love it. They love the community or they love the technology or the challenge, or there's something about it that just they find um, interesting. And so they keep working away at it. And we have some really amazing maintainers who are, you know, students but who have have continued to work on this some who are, are graduates now and continue to work on it which is amazing so one of the great things about open source is that it spans school terms it spans companies you know people continue to work on the same open source project even if they switch companies um, it's great you can continue to be part of this community and a technology you know for as long as you want Okay, so that brought us to version 1.3. So the most recent version of the software is our latest release was version 1.3, and it was a pretty big release. It was, we, re, we did this release nine days ago, and it has all kinds of fixes in it, um, all sorts of updates and things that people have done. Okay, so now it's your turn. So for the next month, a little over a month and a half, I guess, six weeks, I think, is the technical... <laughs> limit of what the course is, um, we're going to work on the next release of this or the next couple releases of this, depending on how far we go. And I want to get all of you engaged in the project and get all of you started on it. 
Okay, so starting on telescope, the first thing I want you to know is that everything that you're going to work on in here was written by um, Seneca students. So lots and lots of Seneca students have worked really, really hard at this. And I, I want to mention that to you because when you get started, you're going to feel like the code is hard or the technology is difficult to set up or whatever. And I want you to know that you can do this because students before you did it, they, they wrote it. Everything that's in here was written by other Seneca students. I know you can handle it too. However, there are aspects of this that are tricky because you're coming into a project that they came into a project that didn't exist, which is a different kind of hard. You're coming into a project that does exist and has already made it to version 1.0. So, you know, we've fixed, I can't remember what the number is. Um, let me look it up here. I wrote it down here. Uh, 450 pull requests, uh, 1,200 commits to get this here. Like it's, it's unbelievable. So, you know, a lot of work has been done even before you get here. So you're coming to a pretty mature piece of software. However, you're also coming to a 1.3 version uh, of software. There's still tons of bugs. There's still tons of features we could add. There's lots of ways we could make it better. So this software isn't finished, it's just getting started. And we've got it to the point where it's usable, but there's more we can do. Okay, so let me take you through and tell you about the architecture and the way that it works and help you to try and understand the code and, and what's going on. Okay, so one of the first things I wanna to mention to you here is this idea of the 12 factor app. So this is a philosophy uh, of how you build web apps or soft software and they have these 12 factors. And I would encourage you to look at the 12 factors. Each one of them you can click on and you can see what it says. But we use a lot of the ideas in the 12 factor approach. So for example, we have all of our code in Git. You know, all of our code base is tracked in a revision control system. We use Git to do that, Git and GitHub. Uh, dependencies are explicitly declared and isolated. We do that with NPM and with Docker, which we'll talk about. Uh, store all of your configuration in an environment. So you're going to see that the project is very heavy on configuration and using ENV, using environment variables and so on to set things up. Uh, building backing services, like it goes on and on. I'm not going to go through all the pieces of it here, logging, administrative process stuff, like all of these different pieces, dev and prod. We have multiple um, servers where we deploy our code. All, all these things I want to talk about. So when you're trying to understand some of the philosophy of how we build this app, looking at the 12, fact, 12 factor app approach will give you uh, a sense of how you build modern software for being able to easily scale it, test it, deploy it, automate it, etc. Okay, so let's go through and talk about what this what this technology is. So when you go and you look at this um, repository. Like many uh, repositories, almost everything in the root directory is some kind of a configuration file. We have configuration files for Docker, for ESLint, for NPM, for Git, for Prettier, Release It. Like you can just see there's tons of them. So most of what is up here in the root is um, stuff that is stuff that gets used to set up the project. And you'll notice that this is all in Git. So what we want to do is we want to have as much of our configuration, as much of our architecture, we want to make it code. So the more you can make code, the more that you can put in Git, the better. We don't want to do anything. You might say to yourself, wouldn't it be easier if I just installed things on Windows and I just clicked through a bunch of wizards and I just had a bunch of instructions to follow? And the thing is, it seems easy when you start because it's it's maybe easier to understand how to begin. But what we've got here is much easier to um, automate and for people for us to run on in unsupervised settings because everything is just coded. So you're going to find tons and tons of stuff in here that is all configuration. So most of the stuff at the top level is config. Above that, we have a great folder full of documentation. Our docs are really good. Some of our contributors have spent a long time making these docs, you know, excellent. And so even today when I was preparing for this uh, lecture, I had to go back and reread all these docs because I can't remember half the stuff. Like 
When I'm working on this code every day, I know it inside out. And as soon as I stop working on it for a week, I forget everything <laughs> and I have to go back. So writing good documentation is critical. So for you, when you're getting started, the contributing.md guide is really good. And it takes you through and talks about some of the things you need to, uh, to set this up. There's a really good document on setting up the environment. And it's quite extensive because depending on whether you're on Linux or on Windows, if you're on a Mac, um, and there's different ways of setting up some of the different subsystems that we use. So a lot of great documentation here when you're going through trying to figure out how this works. Uh, okay, what else is in here? All of our source code is in the source directory. All of our tests are in the test directory and we have a bunch of um, scripts and automation pieces to how, the, the, how we do deployments and so on. And those are all stored inside of tools. So if you look inside source, the app is broken up into two, two directories. In my view, it should really be three directories because we have, we have three main parts to the system. The first part of the system is we have, a, um, we have an RSS feed parser. So when I showed you what these RSS feeds look like, we need to constantly go and download those RSS feeds and we need to parse them and then stick them into our databases and be able to use them in our system. So one of the pieces in the back end is the feed parser. Another thing in the back end that we have is we have a REST API and GraphQL uh, system written in Node. So a lot of what this system is, it's a, it's a web service. So all of the data that you get out of the service um, happens over REST or GraphQL. We have GraphQL right now and we may be moving away from it. So I'm not gonna spend a ton of time talking about it right now, but just mention that it exists. So we use a system um, called Bull to manage our feed parser. And so what Bull does is it gives us a queue. So the idea is that we can feed jobs into one end of the queue and then other processes can pull them out of the, at the other end of the queue. So it's like a big line or a conveyor belt. So we're constantly pushing jobs into the queue and then other, thing, other parts of the system are reading things out of the queue and processing them. So we have a distributed architecture where pieces of um, the program are running in different processes and different servers. It's not just one program that all runs together. Uh, okay, so let's, what else can I say about, let's talk about the front end. So our front end is currently written using a React framework called Gatsby. And Gatsby is really amazing for building uh, data-driven static websites. So if you have a database of data and you wanna produce static HTML pages using React, so you wanna get, get the benefits of React, but you wanna use static data to do it, this is, this is a tool that will generate that for you. So we built this with Gatsby partly because we were really excited to try Gatsby. And I think that we've come to the end of like how useful Gatsby is for what we're trying to do. The way we've built our system, we don't use Gatsby to its fullest. So we have a bug right now to transition away from Gatsby and we want to try using a different React framework called Next.js. So maybe you'll get involved in doing some of that. But right now we're using Gatsby and Gatsby's fantastic. So if you are interested in Gatsby right now, that's what our front end is written in. We use Material UI for all of our React components. And so we don't write our own components. Like if you need, um, like if you need a button, uh, we use the, you know, we use the buttons that are available from Material UI. If you need a progress bar, if you need a form, whatever you need, there's already uh, amazing React components that are already built. We use this because all of the things like cross-browser compatibility, accessibility, all these different things that are really hard to do if you do it, you know, on your own, these things have already been done for us. Um, we have a very complex sign-in system because we had to integrate with Seneca's sign-in server. So in other courses, you've taken on web and authentication. You've probably learned about JWT uh, or JOT, however you want to pronounce it, for being able to do token-based authentication when you log into a system. 
Because we're integrating with Seneca, you've all seen this login form. So this is a login service that's provided by Microsoft. And if you ever look at the URL, what they're using is they're using SAML. Uh, SAML is the uh, single sign-on uh, um, technology that they're using. It's an XML ba web-based system for doing sign-in. And I'll demonstrate how it works in a second. But in order to work with this, we have a somewhat complex setup because we have to simulate this in a development environment or in the real system, we have to integrate directly with Seneca's servers to be able to do the authentication. We wanted to do this because we want Seneca students to be able to log into the system. And so, you know, Seneca already knows if you're a Seneca student or a Seneca uh, faculty and we can use the service in order to, um, we can use the service to be able to authenticate you. I don't wanna store a password for you. I don't wanna know your password. I don't wanna have a database with Seneca login information because it's a, it's a security risk. So instead what I wanna do is I wanna integrate with another sign-in provider to be able to do this. Okay, so our backend is, um, makes use of a bunch of different services. So the first one we use is we use a, a cache service called BS, or called Redis. It's a BSD licensed cache. So Redis is, it's an in-memory key value store. And what it lets you do is it lets you store all kinds of interesting data types. You can store sets, lists, strings, hashes. Um, it's incredibly fast. And so Redis tends to get used to build caching layers. So if you want to be able to access data quickly, we use it to, every time we parse a, a feed and we get all these posts, we have all that data and we stick that data into Redis so that we can pull it out really quickly. Right now we are overusing Redis. And so that's been uh, something that we want to fix in, maybe you want to get involved in the database part of this we'd like to move some of what we're doing in Redis right now to another cloud database so that it's easier to, we want our Redis server to be ephemeral, so we should be able to spin it down, spin it back up and just recreate all the data without having to constantly worry about backups and all those kinds of things. We use another server, database server called Elasticsearch. So we do full text search in the system. You can go and search you know, what did somebody write about a particular technology in their posts, or you want to go back and find something. So we index everything using Elasticsearch, and it takes care of uh, doing all that for us. We use Nginx to do uh, reverse proxying and HTTP caching. So Nginx is a, it's a web server. Basically, it's a web server, but it, it's a very, very fast server for doing various um, web-based tasks. So we have a node, we have our node app, and the node app sits behind Nginx. Nginx is what sits, you know, right on the internet connection. And Nginx proxies requests from the internet back to the node server, and it caches results from the REST APIs. So a lot of times we don't even need to talk to the backend server because we can just cache the results in Nginx and get a real performance boost. Um, if you're interested in deployment and DevOps and so on, you might be interested in working on our Nginx setup. We have some bugs related to that and the way that we do, um, the way that we, 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 we serve all of this. When you're doing this on a local machine, you don't have to worry about this. But when you're putting this into production, when you put node apps into production, it's really common to put the node apps behind um, a reverse proxy like this. We have to uh, we have to operate over HTTPS uh, secure connections, and so we use Let's Encrypt to get our certificates, and we use a system called Certbot to automate updating those certificates. So we have we had to write code to be able to automatically renew certificates and and install certificates for the app. Again, it makes it kind of complicated. Anytime you have any security stuff going on, it's it's pretty complicated to make this all of this work. Because we have so many servers, you know, we've got Redis, Elasticsearch, Nginx, Certbot, login servers. We just have tons and node servers. We have all these different systems that all talk to each other in in like it's an ecosystem or a network. What we've done is we've used Docker and Docker Compose. 
So we use these tools in order we've containerized or made it possible for us to easily recreate the, the entire environment of a server and then bring them all up together or take them all down together, deploy them as a group, update them, etc. So if you're interested in DevOps, you're interested in Docker and all those kinds of things, you might get involved in working on our Docker Docker files or our Docker Compose, all of the scripts that we have to be able to make our setup and deployment stuff go. Um, we have a lot of stuff for the developer experience. And in the coming weeks, in the coming labs, I'm gonna to talk to you a bunch about how to set some of this stuff up. So I wanna teach you this, but right now, um, let me just show you what we do. So I have a PR here from Joel who, he, he's, this is 1224. The most recent pull request on the telescope uh, system is this one. Show all posts for an author sorted by date when searching by author. So the pull request has gone up and I wanted to show you what we do whenever a pull request comes in. So when you go down here, you'll see that um, on GitHub, we have all these integrations. So you can see that we are, we are, we have green check marks from Travis CI, Circle CI, Vercel, Node.js, three of them for um, for GitHub. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six different six different machines have built the code for each pull request, run the tests, check that everything's working correctly, and then reported back to GitHub. So we use a lot of what's called continuous integration in order to make sure that nobody breaks anything. Because when you have this many people writing code, it's really easy to break something. So we do a lot of automation. We even automate the front end. So you'll notice that every one of the, um, every one of the PRs that we have inside of, um, inside of Telescope, you'll get this button. It'll say Vercel has deployed this preview. So if I click on view deployment, you'll see that it's running our app on, um, it's running our app on Vercel. <clears throat> Vercel is a company, um, Vercel, they're a great company for doing static hosting and Jamstack hosting and so on. And this is the pull request, where am I here? Sorry, I'm, I need to go here. This is the pull request that Joel wrote and I can test it. So what's great about this is if I go and test out his, let's just try it out here. So if I look up author and I type in Joel and I do a search, it gives me back the card for the author, but it also has all of Joel's posts in the timeline below it, which is really cool. This is something I've wanted for a long time. So that's awesome. So it means that when I wanna review somebody's code, I have all of this integrated directly into the pull request. So I'm showing you this quickly because a lot of people worked to make this kind of thing possible so that we have the experience of writing code for Telescope is this highly integrated thing where there's lots and lots of automation that happens to make it easier to check that things work and that we stay on track with this stuff. Uh, what else do we have? So we use a lot of tools to help us write code in a very specific way. So we use Prettier. A lot of you, if you've worked with me on any web programming in the past, have probably heard me talk about Prettier, but if you've never seen it before, the idea of Prettier is that you take code that looks like this and you turn it into code that looks like this. In other words, you make that code prettier. And I'm gonna talk about Prettier in, a, in an upcoming lecture, so I won't spend too much time on it right now, but it's an automatic formatter. So in the Telescope project, we all use the same source code format by using tools to do the formatting for us. We use the Airbnb style guide. So we have tools that automatically make sure that all of the code that we write it is the same way that they write code at Airbnb. And it's been, it's been mostly pretty good. There's a few things you'll find that are a little annoying or different than you're used to, and you'll have to adjust your code. Most of it can be automatically fixed. And um, ESLint that we use is integrated with the Airbnb style guide to make that easier. We write all of our tests in Jest. And I'll be talking about this in the coming weeks, and you'll hear me tell you more about, we're gonna, we're gonna get some experience writing tests and learning how to do that. And we have a real emphasis on being able to write tests and um, getting it to work. 
So, you know, in addition to, to what you're hearing here, we use hundreds and hundreds of different node modules. And so there's like a huge amount of dependencies. When you're getting started working on this project, there's a lot to it. There's, you know, multiple different aspects to it um, that you have to get used to. Okay, so let me show you um, how, how it works when you run it locally. I have an instance of Telescope running on my machine right now. Here it is, uh, localhost 8000. And it is, you know, the same thing that we have deployed on our staging server. Um, okay, so how do you run this thing? Well, in order to run this thing, I have to I have to run multiple different uh, servers all at the same time. So I had to install and run a Redis server. I have to install and run an Elasticsearch server. So those are running on my machine. I then have to run a login server so that I can do the login, which I'll show you in a second. So I'm running um, I'm running the login server inside inside of Docker here. I have the back end running here and you can see that it's, um, I'll just move this. You can see that the back end is processing feeds. So as it's going through, it's checking to see anyone who has new content, it's automatically downloading it, parsing it, putting it into Redis, putting it into Elasticsearch, making it so that um, all that data is available. And I also have the front end, um, the front end had to get built. And so I have a I have a development version of the front end that's running in order to make this work. And that means that I can run this in a couple of ways. So I can interact with the back end on localhost 3000. You can see that it's automatically giving me back responses to the, the REST API calls that I make. If I ask for a specific post like this post here, You can see that it gives me back the raw HTML for this post. And I don't have the rest of the site, I just have the, the content of this post that has been, has been brought in. Um, the front end's running on another port on localhost 8000. And so this is where I'm running, this is where I'm running the front end, the Gatsby front end. So what's tricky about this is I'm running back end services and front end services. And when I'm developing on this, I have to have all of it sort of all of it working at once. So it's a system, it's not one program, it's a series of programs that are all put together in, um, you know, in different pieces. Let me, let me shut this down and just show you how I, uh, how I get this all started and what it looks like. So we use Docker Compose which has, you have to install Docker and Docker Compose in, in, the, in the lab this week, you're gonna do that. So I am gonna run Docker Compose. And then what I can do is I can tell it, um, I can tell it that I want to bring up any number of services. So I could tell it, I wanna run Redis, I wanna run Elasticsearch, I wanna run um, the login server, all of these things are documented. In this case, I only care about running the login server. So I'm gonna say Docker Compose up login, and it is going to start up the login server and the login server is now sitting here and it's running. So this is a PHP based uh, server that's running in Apache inside of a container. So I'm just gonna leave this running over here. And then I'm going to start up the backend server. You start the backend server with npm start. It has to connect to Redis, Elasticsearch, spin up the web server. And so you can see that it's connected to Elasticsearch and um, it'll start processing, start processing feeds over here. Um, in my third tab, I'm just gonna leave it running. So I've got these two services running. In my third tab, I need to, I need to run the front end. And the way we do that is npm run develop, like so, and that will start the development server in the front end app. So within this one repository, we have back end apps, front end app, like they're all in, they're different 
applications, but they're all inside one, what we call a mono repo. So we could split this thing up into smaller repositories, but what we've done is we've kept everything inside this one giant repository so that all of the code goes together. The docs are all there, the code for the front end, the back end, all these different pieces are all available in, in this one place. So once this finishes, I'm going to have my back end, my back end server should already be running here. If I, let's try it again. If I go to posts, yeah, it's working. So I'm getting, I'm getting this, or if I said, show me all of the feeds, it gives me all of the feeds that are available here. Um, so that's working. And here it's still building the front end. So Gatsby automatically has things like um, the bundling compilation of resources to optimize them. Um, like it's doing a million things for you. So that's why we call it a React framework because it's, it's just doing so, so much work on our behalf. Now I get a, once this is finished, I'm going to have my server running at localhost 8000. So if I refresh this, I'll get my server. There it is. And that's great. So, so this is working. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to pause this here. I just wanted to take you on that quick tour and I'm going to do another video where I'm going to fix a bug. In fact, I'm going to show you this bug because I hate it. So if I go here, if I kill this server, so control C, do you see how it crashes right here? So there's a bug where um, every time we try and shut down the feed parser, it um, it comes up, it can't find property ID of undefined. I want to fix this bug. So I'm going to take you through and show you what it's like fixing a bug in Telescope so that you have, you know, start to finish what, what I would expect from you in order to uh, to do this on your own. So I'll see you. I'll see you in the next video.